Good afternoon, everyone. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Carnegie Mellon University in Qatar. Uh, I am Michael Schrick, I'm the Dean here, and I am really delighted to see so many people here today to learn more about incorporating purposeful inclusion and belonging practices into the workplace. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Wanda Heading Grant, the inaugural Vice Provost for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and Chief Diversity Officer at Carnegie Mellon University. She is also a distinguished service professor at the Heinz College of Information Systems and Public Policy. Dr. Heading Grant is an accomplished leader in the areas of diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and justice. Throughout her three decades in higher education, she has established programs, policies, and practices fundamental to the advancement of inclusive excellence and leadership. Her wealth of professional experience and volunteer involvement have earned her a reputation as a cultural architect, able to build and sustain real change. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wanda Heading Grant. Well, is it morning? No, it's afternoon. Thank you, everyone. I was saying to folks, um, gosh, if I knew I was actually gonna be in this space, I probably would have taken, like wore some regular shoes and not my sneakers. So, um, but then I thought my sneakers may, in the end, keep me moving and jumping around and so forth. I am so grateful for being here and standing in front of you. And thank you, um, Dean Trick. I really appreciate being invited here. And um, Annette, I don't know what to say. You have just outdone yourself and your colleagues here and just welcoming uh, my team and I here and I'm very grateful. And I'm very happy and grateful that my husband Jarvis was able to travel with me and um, come see me do my thing. Um, and so I'm very excited to bring just a short um, brief thoughts to you and then hopefully through some conversation or some questions that will be asked of me, that you'll get a good sense of who I am, get a good sense of what I'm thinking in terms of D and I being. So let, let me start by saying in its simplest words, what D and I B is. And um, there'll be some slides behind me. I'm not necessarily reading those slides, but it'll give you some great context as I talk about this. In its simplest words, diversity is having a guest list. You ever have a guest list? you know, for a party or a gathering. You hear this all the time. And on that list is a list of individuals um, from, a variety, from a variety of places, backgrounds, um, representing multiple kinds of people who are invited to the party. Inclusion is about not only being invited, but being asked to dance while you're at that party. You've heard that. I know some of you have heard that. Equity is producing equal outcomes. For instance, giving everyone, giving everyone a pair of shoes in terms of equality, but then equity is about making sure that everyone gets the pair of shoes that fit them. And so when I think about it in the context of, you know, that party is an opportunity to really enjoy that party and being able to select the songs that are important to you that you like to dance to and I like lots of genres, so I can dance to all of them. And belonging is really being involved in the creation of that party. Being there, um, people noticing if you're not invited to that party. If you, they might not start that party without you. You get to select, get to select what some of the songs are on that party, that playlist. And so showing up truly and being your true authentic self when you get to that party. So I get to dance like I wanna dance. I get to choose some of the music that's there and um, people know that I'm present or care that I'm present or not. Listen, I think about this often and daily. How do you success successfully practice and create belonging and inclusion within a higher education setting within a non-higher education setting and beyond. It is not easy to do this work, especially at this moment 
and at this time is the kind of effort that requires time, patience, commitment, knowledge, and courage. It requires an ethic of care for others and a willingness to hold yourself accountable and not just others accountable. And most important, you must want to do it. You must be willing to stay steadfast on that journey. Have you ever felt like you did not belong? Have you ever felt that way? What emotions did you feel? Can you remember a time that you may have contributed to someone else not feeling like they belonged? What were those emotions? Were they different? How did you feel? What was your awareness? Was it shortly after you made them feel that way or was it much later? For instance, have you ever been in a conversation or a training session and memories started to flood back to you about a question you were asked, a decision you made, the way you act, and in today's world, looking through it at a DEI Benz V lens, that you feel like, oh my gosh, I wished I had that information at that time, or I didn't know I had done something possibly wrong. I have been in those situations. I recognize that. I see myself as a lifelong learner. I take in that information, reflect on that information, and try to do and be different, even if I can't always go back. So I want to take a moment to applaud you for being here, for taking this time and making an effort to think about the role you have in creating belongingness for yourself and for others. I'm gonna first share a story with you, a story that sometimes I share around inclusivity and belonging in terms of what it means to me. Dr. Don Bennett Alexander, a prominent faculty member at the University of Georgia, talks about her Rosetta Stone, her Rosetta, her Rosetta moment, a defining moment when she was a girl around the age of eight years old. She pulled a chair from out from under a young girl named Rosetta. Rosetta fell, cried, while other children laughed. Professor Bennett said she immediately felt horrified and disappointed in herself. She did not know why she did it. For her, it was clearly at odds with who she thought she was and what she was all about, which was a good person. My Rosetta moment was a Tommy moment. I was young, but an adult. When I was visiting my friend Tammy and her family, when her four-year-old son runs inside the house crying, Tammy with her South Carolina accent, we were all in the state of Vermont, and her motherly care asked him why he was crying. He said that James had called him a name. We said, what name? He attempted to pronounce it. We were perplexed for a short second. And then my friend Tammy whipped her head around and she headed for the door. She was moving and I was in pursuit. I was no longer perplexed. It had dawned on me what really had happened. What? Tommy had been really called. He had, been called. he had been called something disgusting, a racial slur. What was even sadder was that our little Tommy knew it wasn't right and that it was intended to do harm and to bruise him. James was four years old. James and his family identified as white. He and Tommy had been playing outside their front doors which was right next to each other in an apartment complex for the last two weeks. And when James became frustrated about something during those play moments, he went to a place that he had, that he had been taught to go to. 
the awareness of being black in America was embedded in me very early in my life. It did not leave me when I went off to college. It was in this new place that I would gain new insight to the crossroads of race, ethnicity, gender, disability, and so forth. It was clear that one could experience the good, the bad, and the ugly in regards to their multiple forms of identity, the multiple roles that they have. I witnessed a stark difference between what would happen to those who, who would let the undercurrent or who couldn't control the undercurrent of discrimination and inequality um, pull them away from the prospects that laid before them and those who were able to turn the tide. These observations fueled my dedication to inclusivity and social equity. I believe that education is one of the most powerful platforms to share and enhance knowledge, understanding, and develop innovative solutions that address issues of civility, bias, prejudice, and discrimination. Through education, learning, and acting, we can shatter oppressive structures and systems, making room for us to construct an authentic sense of belonging for everyone. So, for me, that Tommy moment was at odds once again with the kind of world I wanted to live in. And I decided to double down on my efforts as an individual and collectively with others to work against hate and incivility, disrespect, structural bias, disparate treatment, and so forth, and work towards a culture promoting diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, AKA inclusive excellence, to help raise consciousness so that folk not only do better, but want to, be, want to do better because we all deserve it. I decided then that active education, learning, and implementing would be the platform to help shatter the oppressive structures and systems and make room for us to construct this authentic sense of belonging for everyone. It's important to figure out what is your Tommy or Rosetta moment. I'm sure you have one. I'm sure you've had one, but you might not recognize it. But you know those memories flooding back in this moment, as I said, training and meetings and talking, it may be flooding back. But listen, folks, the work is hard. Why is it hard? And especially as I think about higher education, leaders and champions move on, students eventually graduate, People get new jobs. Societal situations matter on college campuses. They impact us. Sometimes there are no or there isn't accountability, as well as experience and knowledge to get the work done. Everyone can't do what I do. Everyone can't do what my team does. We've studied, we practice, we have experiences. But lo and behold, a lot of people get assigned to do the work without those experiences. We also must think about the history. We must address the history so that we're able to move to a place where it doesn't serve as a barrier that keeps us from getting the work done. And that's a daily journey. So it is my hope that the work that we do in the Office for the Vice Provost for DNI and Chief Diversity Officer for the CMU community is that it creates a foundation for understanding our collective responsibility for D, E, I, and B. We call it 
a framework for inclusive excellence, but you may also call it a recipe for belonging. What makes this recipe, this framework, particularly transformative is that it was built, it's being built on the foundation of values at CMU, the work at CMU, and the commitment to advanced DNIB at CMU by you. And together we will continue to refine, enhance, and pass along this recipe for the betterment of us all. I truly believe that one must have a good recipe for creating belonging and inclusion. Share something with you. My mother, her name was Dorothy. She could make a delectable German chocolate cake. My mother-in-law, her name was Vermel. She could make a mouth-watering sweet potato pie. And you know what? I can make both the delectable German chocolate cake, a mouth-watering sweet potato pie, and a lip-smacking, finger-licking peach cobbler. Do you know why I can do that? Why I can make that yummy pie? Why I can make that great cobbler? Do you know why? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's the list of ingredients in the recipe for each of them. Like a good dessert, getting to belonging inclusion is like mixing the right ingredients, putting in the correct amount of those ingredients and knowing how to adjust those ingredients based on the kind of pan or dish being used, as well as the temperature of the oven and the elevation that you're in. And of course, you must remember to monitor it to check on it. For instance, a good sweet potato pie demands a good structure. A DNIB pie structure demands a good foundation. The crust of the pie is the foundation. It provides shape, parameters, and support. Leadership is the foundation for the DNIB structure with vision, it gives vision, the leadership gives vision, scope, and action. However, you need the filling. It is the core and it is necessary for the pie to work. We the people are the core. We the people are the core of Carnegie Mellon's DNIB pie, this community. The eggs, the butter, the milk, the spices, all of the flavoring are all the diversity and equity and inclusion. That's what it is. It gives texture, it binds, unite, connect all the ingredients together. Applying the right amount of each distinct ingredient with each serving a part to enhance the pie. Without one of those ingredients, the pie becomes less mouth-watering. But together, those diverse ingredients create a delicious pie. These ingredients alone have important uses. However, together, they help to create something memorable, powerful, with the potential to shape our existence. But the only way we can make this existence a reality is through the sacrifice of the individual for the collective community. Eggs have to crack, spices have to be grounded, and potatoes have to be mashed. We must be willing to change and be the change makers, the bakers we ask others to be. As members of this global community, we're bound together with a common goal to help our fellow human, to serve as a guide and as colleagues when needed, to instill commonly held values that encourage acceptance, openness, justice, and respect. You will encounter resistance at times, even from those who ask for help. You may struggle to reach your goal, but be determined 
and courageous, mostly be a part of advancing towards building, belonging, and not just idling in one place. Leadership, like the crust, must denote those parameters. Sometimes you can buy a store-bought crust. It works, but I'm not sure if it works as well as something homemade. You have to begin to think about how you custom and tell her and divine and, and tell her what you're doing. So as we think about this and as we do this work, it is important for me to say to you that you are part of the solution. You are part of helping to build that structure and that foundation. And you know what? We can do it. We can do it. You can do it. I can do it. But I think it's a place where we start and understand that the beginning of inclusivity and getting to belonging starts with each and every one of us. That means I. So I thank you for giving me this moment to share my thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Heaven Grant, for that insightful keynote. There were many takeaways. Uh, now we'll commence to the next part of today's session, which is the question and answer. I invite the members of the audience to please use the mics that we have stationed at the left as well as to the right of you uh, to ask your questions. As uh, Before you pose your question, if you could state your name and your affiliation, that would be appreciated. Um, why don't I go ahead and get started with a question to you, Dr. Henning Grant. What has influenced your thinking around DNI and motivated you to get involved in being an advocate for change? Thank you for that question. Um, so part of it, I um, gave some indication, which is related to the experiences that I've had in life. Um, and um, earlier on, how I was raised, where I was raised, I was born in Trenton, New Jersey, and was raised there, and I was raised um, in a situation where I felt like there was um, opportunities where people who look like me um, could have more of resources, uh, more of equitable resources, and felt like, you know, something was a little off and I wasn't treated as well. And as a young child, as I watched how my mother, my father, my siblings and aunts and uncles were being treated, not every day, but off and on, it just didn't seem right. So that gave me a foundation of wanting to have and do something different. And then I also realized, um, I started to have, as I was getting older, a care for other people. Um, that I could give language to uh, what was happening around me and that I cared about the fellow person that was next to me and around me. And that took me off into a career of being a social worker and really wanting to give back um, to the world and be able to make a difference. So it was my upbringing. It was some of the experience that was happening, happening um, around me and to me and as well as other individuals that I um, was related to or connected to in some kind of way. And it just felt like it should be different. It should be better. We should care about each other more. And that's what always stick with me. Even when I tried to ignore it, um, I, um, I would get involved and engaged. And there's a number of situations that um, I chose to uh, be an active bystander um, and not um, stand there and watch it happen. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the audience? Hi, um, I'm Kira Dreyer, I'm in the English department. And um, my question for you is, um, since you've gotten to CMU and you've established this office and done all of this amazing um, work, um, I'm wondering, um, from the point that you're in now, um, what are the areas at CMU, broadly speaking, that you think um, you know, are, are the areas of needing most work as you move forward, you know, versus what, what were things that CMU has um, done well in so far? So what are kind of those areas that need um, a special attention and then some that have been worked with already? Yeah, so when I first came to CMU, I really wanted to 
um, get to know as much as I could in terms of the individuals and people, um, understand some policies, practices, and procedures, and um, just get a lay of the land. But I also wanted to be able to move quickly in terms of what I knew and felt were um, would be best practices that would serve CMU very well. And so one of the things that really stood out, besides the fact of really sort of applauding CMU for getting to a place where they wanted to have a chief diversity officer, they wanted to have an office filled with individuals who could do this kind of work, that is something that I applaud because all institutions don't have um, this. But what I also saw was that um, an institution that had been doing a lot of wonderful things and I wanted to sort of figure out how to leverage what had been done, but to also coordinate it in a way that would have a systemic coordinated approach to get the work done. And that's where I talk about this framework for inclusive excellence. And so I do think that um, any institution in CMU um, in particular has benefited from this idea of bringing together um, our values um, as well as um, best practices for D and I and B. And so a plan, a roadmap in terms of how we're gonna do it, how we're gonna get it done. And in that, how do we hold each other accountable? And how do we measure that we got to the destination in that moment? Cause it's, it really is a journey more than a destination, but how do we get to, and how do we um, get to where we want to go? So I think that that's one thing. The other thing is that I thought that, um, that CMU that does do things well. I was very um, surprised that um, I understood why some in our community didn't think certain things were happening because we did not do the best job in making it visible, as visible as we could um, when I learned more about the resources that were being put into um, certain activities, events, and efforts, and so forth. The other piece, though, after saying all of those things, um, that we needed to also enhance and make visible more protocols and policies and procedures um, that folks understood that what, what it currently existed, but how also we needed to enhance um, those efforts. Hence, as I said, in some of my uh, folks I've been talking with, I've spoken about the development of a campus climate um, protocol, bias protocol, um, response and um, building a response team in relationship to situations that occur on campus. And so the last thing I would say about that, uh, we're building that piece. We have a framework um, as well as we're preparing for a campus climate survey in relationship to um, students. Um, and um, at this time, mostly going to push forward to, I don't feel like we have to keep inventing a lot of new things. I think we need to make visible what exists but I also think we need to hold people, ourselves, leadership accountable for what we said we were gonna do, the promises that we, we make. I think if we could get there, oh goodness, we would see a lot, a lot of more smiling faces and so forth. So I hope what you hear is that we're doing a lot, but I definitely think that we could always be doing more, but I certainly think we need to be putting some more efforts and making those things visible, accountability, measurement, um, and, 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 and just holding ourselves, our feet to the ground and not always thinking of new things that we can do um, to only go in circles around. Is that helpful? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Damian Dorado. I'm a staff member here. It was nice talking to you yesterday and Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, you have me craving sweet potato pie and I'll, I'll, I'll try to deal with that. But when you talk about your recipe for inclusivity, what can we do as a community of staff, student, and faculties on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, mm -hmm. you have programs and people show up and attend, but on a day-to-day -day basis, how do we create mm -hmm. this inclusive community? Yeah, so great, great question. First of all, let me just say this. Um, because I'm drawn to say this. Um, the, the great late B.B. King gave me a hundred dollar bill for my sweet potato pie. I've cooked, I cooked for him in his orchestra three times and, um, and I wanted to know why he liked my sweet potato pie and he said it was like his mama. That's the word he used. He said mother. He said my mama made and, um, and that's always stuck with me and I like telling that story. Um, so but inclusivity, when you think about um, inclusivity, um, you know, I gave that example about being invited, you know, to, to actually dance. And in a, 
in, the, in this kind of setting, what it means about how do you custom design things for your culture, your community, and so forth. So one of the things we're doing at, um, at, at on campus in Pittsburgh is really, which kind of reflects here too, is really going through policies and procedures and making sure that, um, um, you know, we make it more inclusive and not necessarily focus so much on um, traditional um, binaries in terms of she, her. Um, and so we're going through that to make everyone feel inclusive around those things. We're also thinking about um, how do we have events and programmings at times that, that, that takes into account um, how not only students go to class, but how people sometimes worship and, um, and, um, and, and how that's important. And so really thinking about what's in writing how the language can be more inclusive and more inviting and understandable being, being friendly. But we're also really thinking about the idea around how do you hold, again, people accountable for things like microaggression, um, discrimination, um, for doing and saying things that don't make people feel welcome or feel like they belong. And it's not always the idea of something punitive. Um, there are sometimes people do things and say things that, you know, we need to take care of that. But there are other times that people do and say things that we need to be thinking about how do we restore? How do we educate? How do we inform? And so um, in terms of when I think about, you know, higher education and so forth, I think you have to have all of those things in your toolkit. It is not a one size fit all in order to do this work. And, um, and what fits for you won't fit for me. Um, and that's the equity part and, um, and, and so forth. So, so I think it is really about looking at your community and thinking about it from a DE, DE and IB lens about how do you get to belonging and getting to belonging is beyond those numbers. It doesn't matter if it's one or two individuals who are at your institution that you somehow unfortunately have decided that is too different in having experiences. It doesn't matter if no one is here but yourself. What are you going to train, educate, and inform yourself about how you treat yourself and how you treat the first person who would walk through that door. We wanna make sure that they have the dish at the table that they can eat. And we wanna make sure that they also um, um, are a part of creating that dish um, so, they, so they have it in the form that they wish. So really looking at what's here and what your folks are saying. Maybe the last thing I'll just quickly say about that, um, when I look at a whole pie structure, you know, um, we should use data to inform us. We don't always need to have data drive us. Um, so, because there are other stories and situations that will inform the whole situation. So I'm going to encourage that we need to also be looking at data to help, make, help us make decisions about what inclusivity means to your community right here. Um, so hopefully that's helpful, some ideas. But let's fill, fill our toolkit box. Hi, my name is Martin. I'm currently a student here at CMU. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask is, how exactly do you recommend navigating things like microaggressions from professors, for example? Because in most cases, you might be the only one student that might be facing that, and talking or basically speaking up against that would would kind of like show that it's coming from you. So how exactly do you uh, recommend people coming and actually talking about some of the issues that they might be facing anywhere from the class, for example? Great, great question. So um, as an undergraduate student, I went to a predominantly, from um, what we say, a predominantly white institution. And so um, at the time that I attended my institution, there were lots of times I was the only one. And even as an administrator, there are times when I am the only one. And when I say I am the only one, I identify as being black and African-American. And here's what you need to know. There does not mean that there are other, are other identities or situations I, I, I don't, that I don't talk about. I talk about lots of things. But I also speak to who I am. 
And so in those situations, as I personally have experienced microaggressions or behaviors that I would consider bias, one of the important facts is that as institutional leader, that we have to be willing to make sure that there's professional development um, and as well as accountability. So first of all, I encourage all leaders in administration um, as well as um, academics, faculty, um, professors, um, you know, uh, um, um, instructors, whatever the language, whatever the titles, need to understand what is a microaggression, need to understand how it makes people feel, needs to understand that it does cause harm, it is hurtful, it causes people to leave institutions, it causes people to feel bad. Um, and over and over again, are having those kinds of things are very harmful to our community. And so professional development is one, um, I think, avenue is to make sure people understand um, those who are being microaggressed and those who are causing the microaggression. And then I, um, and in that to, to learn what to do and not to do. I think the second thing is about accountability. At some point, this is why the bias, um, the campus climate bias protocol is being developed. There are lots of situations that happen in classrooms or on college campuses that do not meet the threshold as it relates to um, violation of a federal law or institutional policy, but it still hurts. And that's, we wanna be able to address those. And so developing such a practice, a protocol, will assist our faculty, staff, and especially students to be able to have a process, a place to go to, to share when something has happened. And when they share that something has happened, in this case, what I'm developing with my team is that there will be a team that's there to support, to educate and inform. So education, education, accountability for the behavior. And, um, and with the hope is that we all uh, work to not be silent bystanders. Silence does not help us all. So I ask people to speak up and share and you should not have to own that situation, that comment all by yourself. There should be people around you who have the information, who can show up and it will share. That was not okay. And so the great part, because you are CMU, is that you will be getting a chance to benefit from, benefit from this um, um, bias, um, campus bias protocol policy. Uh, well, it's really a, a protocol, or I'll say a small p uh, policy that will be available to the community here, of course, as part of our CMU family. Does that help? Hi, my name is Hi. Mugur. I'm a CS freshman here. Um, Thank you so much for your wonderful speech and for the amazing work that you and the entire team does to make CMU such Thank an you. inclusive and diverse environment. I hope I speak for everyone here when I say CMUQ really feels like a home. My question is the following. How can we students become advocates for diversity and inclusion and perhaps talk about the goods and celebrate them and also talk about the bad things that happen mm -hmm. and try to work and fix them? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think some of it we've seen, I think it's important um, for um, students to get engaged and involved and what that means that you could be the first that is establishing a, a, a club, a group, a, a task force. You could be the first that writes something that asks and make requests for certain kinds of um, um, whether it's resources and monies, whether it is um, workshops or training, um, you can invite speakers in and so forth. You could lead um, um, talks, um, you could lead unity walks, any, any of those kinds of things. But I do think it's important to educate yourself. Um, we all hear a lot of things and we're educated by what we see on television. Um, we're educated sometimes about the conversations we're having in our, you know, our um, residential communities or at the, the kitchen table and so forth. But oftentimes, particularly these days, this is complex work. It's complicated and so much is going on and so much is happening. And so one of the things I think in terms of getting involved is understanding what you're getting involved in and understanding just as we're asking um, faculty administrators to understand where you are coming from. I think it's important to understand the complexities of where they're coming from, but also understand the complexities of what makes things challenging and, and difficult. But I do think that for me, um, and really engaging with student activism, um, 
and, and my previous institution and so forth, students are such a key. You're here to learn, you're here to get the information, but it's such a key and having a key and moving that needle and moving the mountain. So silence doesn't help. And when I talk about activism, activism does not always come in the form of shouting the loudest. I need you to share your story and speak and also shout so that others might hear me and might hear them over there and so forth. So it's not about just you, it's the collective and it's about getting involved in all levels um, and understanding what you have embarked on. But certainly I love following behind a student. Um, hi, my name is Jaron Neville, I'm a staff member. Um, thank you again for your talk. One of the things that you mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, was talking about biases. Um, we all have our own biases, and I think part of it is when we're going into, we don't necessarily even realize we have our own biases. So when we're interacting with each other, we may not realize that the things that we're doing or saying could be seen as a microaggression, could be seen as hurtful or harmful to others. And because we're such a large international community, we're all coming from different mm -hmm. places, have different backgrounds, different religions. And so my question to you is, when we start doing the work on ourselves, how do we start to, what guides or tools or things that we can, we can use individually to start assessing us individually to do this type of work? Like, and I think that's part of the thing. You said not everybody can do this work. And granted, not everybody can do what you do, but you mentioned, you touched on doing your research, doing some learning on your own. Do you have a list of things where we, as individuals in this community, can start to do that individual work so that we can work collectively together? Yeah, thank you for that question. So let me um, clarify. When I talk about, you know, not everyone can do that work, what I'm talking about is everyone cannot do that work in terms of thinking about it very, um, having practiced, um, having um, learned and gotten certified um, um, to do the work in terms of being able to map what the work requires and be very strategic about it and stay in it um, uh, for the long haul. Um, um, so some folks, the first time someone hurts your feelings, I'm mad, I'm walking away. Um, and, it, it, and I've gained a very thick skin about that. But individually, on your own, um, and, and it clearly not so much to be repetitive, but it is the truth. I mean, you really have to, part of doing the work is, is reading. As part of doing the work is talking to others about um, their journey, their process, share, reflect how you feel, um, find key partners and be a part of groups um, um, it, 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 to, 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 to help you sort through and navigate that. In terms of actually being more formal with that particular work, there are things like professional development and learning where there are tools that you can put in your toolkit that helps you, that guides you. There are professional organizations and entities. There are um, particular um, programs um, that will, will, will provide tutorials about things that you can think about and so forth. But here's the thing that's important that I think out of all what I said, because this is gonna be a different journey for everyone. I think it's important that you have to wanna do it. And I think you have to wanna be a part of it forever. I also need you to know that that journey individually changes over time. At some point, you may be um, this far away from where you're trying to get and then eventually you're moving closer. And so how do you do that work? I think it's practice, practice, practice over time. And I think it's talking to key advisors and individuals who have those backgrounds um, and to give you information and to guide you. You might wanna try this um, organization and this network. You might let me have an individual that I like to recommend that you talk with. Let, why don't you think about why that impacted you that way? Why don't you write that down? Come back, let's talk about what we need to do. And then for some people, 
it really works for them to be a part of something where they are those change agents, where they're going to go and talk to the powers that be, the people that influence, and to share what you would like to see happen. I um, don't want to catch anyone off guard, but oftentimes, sometimes I say to my team, which is I think it's a great place to say, I just like for them to stand, if I may, um, Dr. Byron Martin, Mark D'Angelo, Danielle Jackson. These are individuals, yes. <clears throat> These are individuals that have been helping to get this work done. And so one of the things I want to encourage because we have a couple more days here. That individual piece that you talk about, approach us. But what I'm also going to do is make sure that we provide a collective list that we're gonna ask Annette to share with everyone that will work well um, to get you started and to guide you. And you know what the great part? I'm gonna keep saying it, you are CMU. And even though we're not here every day, we are here for you to help you, and you can call upon us anytime um, to do the work. And we're so glad that Annette is here as well. That helps to create that liaison. So I hope that helps, and we're all here to help you. And Thank hey, you. utilize us. Okay. Thank you. One final question. Uh, hi, um, I'm Ehsan. I'm a business administration student. Uh, my question is, so uh, in this era, I think one of the biggest challenges uh, regarding academic environment is the, gen the danger of like one single story that has been transmitted throughout like um, several curriculums. So I understand where CMU now um, situating themselves in this fight um, of like trying to believe that like um, biases that are holding within even curriculums that has been transmitted um, to generations through um, different classes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. You're, you're, I, I, I don't know if I understand the question or you're making the point. Uh, it's a question. So it's more like how is CMU trying to find the risk of the single story type of like gender um, where there's like only one single story transmitted um, and one bias is happening throughout like different curriculums? Yeah, so um, in terms of um, um, I, I'm thinking about a couple of things. So CMU, I believe, understands that there are diversity of voices, um, that um, my story that I shared with you is not the same story of someone who looked like me and was raised in the same, person, um, same place, that there are diversity of individuals who, um, 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 within our communities, and that everyone um, it makes me think about the idea around equality versus equity is what's coming up to my mind, coming to my mind. So we're, we're, we're all here. We're all receiving that education, but we all may need something different in order to make us feel whole, um, in order to help us achieve what we need to achieve. I do worry about those individuals who have not done the work, who see certain groups of people and think that they are one and the same, or understand them and their backgrounds and their stories or how you should approach them and how you should deal with them in many ways, one and the same. And it, one is not. And so thinking about the danger of a single story, the danger of a single story does not advance us in doing our work. And I, I, I truly believe not just my team, but across the university, all the academic diversity officers, all the DNI leads, um, the individuals who have taken this up in terms of the work they do uh, work very hard to make sure that that does not happen, that, um, that folks are seen as individualistic in terms of who they are and what they do in their background and what they need, as well as understanding collectively how powerful we can be together in creating new stories and as well as um, um, what's the word I want to use, as well as celebrating one's individual story. Um, so I hope that's either answering a question or I'm getting at what you mean in terms of um, Chimamanda, in terms of what she has said. As a matter of fact, if I thought about it, I would have my picture with her face against my picture, my face, where um, we're making faces together. Um, at a dinner we were having together. And so um, her, her, her work is very powerful. And um, 
and I think it's well utilized and thought about in terms of uh, what we do at CMU. And the great part, these individuals here are fully aware of the work that she does and talks about. Thank you. So we've come to the end of the session. I would like to invite Dean Trick on stage. Hello, uh, thank you, Wanda, for um, those insightful and actionable uh, words. Uh, very happy to have you here. Uh, we do have a, a little memento to thank you for being here. So, uh, and okay, that uh, concludes our event for today. We do have um, a little bit of lunch back there. Um, I'd like to invite you all to enjoy and uh, perhaps discuss some of the things you've heard today and uh, think about how we're gonna be moving forward on these issues. Thank you all very much, and Wanda, again, thank you so much. <laughs>